Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to this edition of Living the Little Way. St. Therese lived in a beautiful part of France and lived in a convent, a cloistered convent. And she was part of a local church called the Diocese. And every uh, church throughout the world, every Catholic church throughout the world, belongs to a particular diocese that is their geographical location. Today we want to talk a little bit about the history of our own diocese, the history of the Diocese of Sioux Falls. And I have with me today uh, Spencer Titus and also James Nelson, who are two of the seminarians for the Diocese of Sioux Falls that are currently doing a review and study of the history of our diocese. So I welcome you both today. Um, one of the books that um, we've been considering as we go along this study is called Faith and Tenacity. It was written uh, by uh, one of our own parishioners, not parishioners here, but parishioners at the cathedral. Uh, and it details the first hundred years of the Diocese of Sioux Falls. Um, both of you have had different kind of reactions to it. Um, I'll start with you, James. What's your reaction to that book? Uh, for me, I really enjoy it. Uh, I grew up in South Dakota, and I grew up driving around where, you know, I was told what the numbers on the back of the license plates were for what counties they were, and uh, I've had the opportunity to travel around, you know, eastern South Dakota a fair bit, um, which is, of course, the Diocese of Sioux Falls. Uh, so getting to read the first hundred years of our diocese for me, and I love history, so reading that has been uh, fruitful and you know like reading some of these small towns that I've spent time in or that I that I know of uh, for me just kind of giving that context I really enjoy. What about you Spencer you had? Yeah um, I'm not a big history guy so it was kind of hard getting into it but the more I got into it the more I'm starting to like it which is good and it's really cool for me to see the history of the diocese and see the struggles that they've had uh -huh. um, at the beginning of our diocese when it was coming together and also the similarities of uh, what we're going through right now and the struggles in our diocese right now. That's an interesting point you know we talk about how the diocese itself was formed um, when the first missionaries came here it wasn't a diocese at all it was just mission territory uh, and then we were appointed our first bishop, Bishop Martin Marty, who had an interesting way of getting around the diocese. He'd get in a canoe sometimes and just paddle up the river uh, or take a horse. And, uh, but he was um, always on the go, visiting all of these new parishes and uh, facilities that he opened. First of all, he was a Benedictine monk, but which is way different than we think a Benedictine monk would be doing. What sticks out in your minds? Uh, for me, I guess his uh, resilience. I mean, he came to a, a wide open territory. Uh, it's not like they had a map like we have today. I can go pick up a South Dakota highway map and get around. You know, he didn't have that. Uh, he didn't have cars. He had to rely on trains when he was lucky when some of the uh, railways got built. He had to rely on, like you said, canoes and, and horses to get around the diocese. And if you read, he really did not stop traveling and, and getting around the diocese, which at one time really was all of North and South Dakota. Um, a huge amount of space. Yeah, and I mean, he, he didn't want to leave. Uh, he, he wanted to stay. He wanted to be a part of the missionary work of, of the Dakota Territory to the very end where one of his last... Um, uh, meetings with the Native Americans. I mean, he would have to take breaks because of his lack of energy. Uh, he'd have to have priests there to help hold him up, basically, and um, kind of reminds me a little bit of Moses in the Old Testament. Yep, when his hands were extended out over the, the people. Mm -hmm. When he lowered his hands, things didn't go so good. Mm -hmm. What about you, Spencer? You know, you're from the northern part of the diocese, and um, that's way different territory than down here. Yeah, uh, for me reading it, just seeing how Bishop Marty um, was always involved and his biggest thing from my perspective was um, how he wanted to fulfill the desires of the people. So they wanted churches and sacraments regularly and he wanted to give that to, to them, to his parishioners, to the people in the, in the diocese. 
And so he went out of his way to try to find solutions to give the people what they needed. So he went like uh, went out and sought missionaries to come in to give the people uh, the sacraments. And he also had a big interest uh, with the Native American um, um, culture. Did. Yep. So that was really cool to see that and very interesting and how he his mission kind of was focused around them. In fact, even, you know, um, and you're more familiar perhaps uh, with Blue Cloud Abbey being up from the northern part of the diocese, that was a daughter uh, uh, monastery of where Bishop Marty had been the abbot. And mm -hmm. so there's been that connection with the Native Americans with St. Meinrad's since the very beginning. Um, one of the things that most interests me about our diocese is the tremendous diversity of people that are there. Some of them are German, some of them are French, some of them are people like myself, Irish, um, but they're from all over. It's a melting pot. Um, and one time, you know, someone told me that nearly uh, two-thirds of the parishes that have been in existence in our diocese no longer exist because there's no longer people in those areas. Um, does that worry you? You know, you guys are considering um, becoming, or at least discerning the, the priesthood here. Um, and we're not like New York or California, which, which is constantly growing. We grow at a slow, steady speed. Does that ever bother you? Um, for me, no, not, not necessarily. Um... I think for the most part, I think it's good to have some diversity in our culture, just so we can see different backgrounds and different morals um, that align with the Catholic faith and, yeah. Different ways of doing things. Yeah. Okay. What about you, James? Well, I guess one of the biggest things that you, I think, have to discern when you're discerning, you know, diocesan priesthood, one of the vows is vow of obedience, and whatever that vow of obedience is, is in a sense, you know, where you're going, and, um, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I love South Dakota, and I love, you know, what all is here, and so wherever uh, that leads, and, you know, whatever path, I would love to be able to just be there. One of the things, you know, you've traveled uh, somewhat extensively in Europe, um, and you've been in some of the traditionally Catholic countries that you go to Sunday Mass and there's next to no one there. Um, do you ever see that happening here? I think on one hand we've seen it a little bit um, as uh, people tend to move away from maybe some of the smaller towns. Uh, one of the photos that's in the book is uh, a map of South Dakota. I, I don't know how many years ago, it, it didn't say the exact date, but of course, the towns that are more populous are the ones that are bigger and bolder. And some of those towns, they, you know, are ones that I met, wouldn't have heard of or that Don't I've been even to. Exist they anymore. might not exist anymore. They're tiny. Um, and I think that's where we have to look at. It's not necessarily dying. Things are shifting. Um, and being able to adjust to where population centers are. This, you know, Sioux Falls was not always the... Um, the sea of our diocese. It was Yankton, but things shifted. We see things shifting in other dioceses, and change can be hard. It's difficult. It's not always fun to accept. Uh, but I think you know life ebbs and flows, and that's part of what I think we have to be able to. And if you don't change, do. you die. Mm -hmm. You know. So one of the things, of course, that our bishop is is, is really uh, made us very cognizant of the fact is that we have to be smart about how we do ministry, how we go out, and how we address the needs of people as missionary disciples, uh, and that just building buildings or building more parishes is not always the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is how we uh, spread Jesus Christ. So as we, as, as you would look on this time, and just for the, the people that are watching today, we meet once a week, and we uh, have gone over this book. We're about halfway through now. Um, and we talk about it over lunch. We, we talk quite extensively about it. Um, and as we have been going over it, has your perspective changed about how you see the diocese? 
For me, I would say, yeah. Um, I think when we take a look at the current reality of our diocese, it can be a little scary when we first look at it, just based on some of the numbers. Um, and we tend to think that this might be a new problem. Uh, but if we look back to the very beginning of the diocese, Bishop Marty was running the entire Dakota Territory on not very many priests. Um, he had the same problem. Yeah, he, he had the same problem that we have. Uh, so it does just kind of take this, you know, twisting, this changing of, of how we're doing things. Um, but knowing that at the end of the day, we are still one, you know, Catholic United Church, Universal Church. What about you, Spencer? Um, my perspective, yeah, I would say I've changed a little bit. Just seeing, um, I think it's increased in the community of South Dakota in general, especially the Sioux Falls Diocese, that reading the history, you can see how the people came together, like the lay and clergy and missionaries, everyone came together to make it work. And just to know and trust that that's going to be the same case in the present, just that we can come together as one and get get through trials and stay on course. There's one place in the book where they were talking about them having built from the Catholic Extension Society a traveling rail car that would have a chapel in it. And they'd go from place to place and they'd pull it off to the siding, have mass, baptisms, all of those kinds of things, and then they'd move on. I think when you read that, you really do realize we've been doing many of these things for many, many years. It's now just becoming more formalized. How much do you think, and I, maybe we can close with this, how much do you think fear plays a part in what we feel comfortable doing or not doing? I think it plays the entire part of it. Um, I, you know, depending how much we let fear run our lives, um, is going to depend on how how open we are. You know, if, if we're going to say, Thy will be done uh, in the Our Father, then sometimes it really means His will be done. And Not we ours. have to be, we have to be able to, uh, you know, be vessels of that to, to carry out whatever that is. And, and sometimes it's going to be what's not comfortable for us, and that's okay. Earlier today, Spencer, you were talking a little bit about you didn't use these words, but the point you were getting at is you can either give in to fear or you can walk through it. Mm. Um, and if you walk through it, um, then you have the possibility of managing that. If you give in to it, then you're being ruled by it constantly. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of like um, when you're in a transitional period in time, it presents opportunity to either trust God or to get overwhelmed in fear and not want to change anything and just kind of hold back, pull back, I guess. And um, when we allow ourselves to allow ourselves to trust God in the unknown, then that's where growth comes and good things come. But It's absolutely right. When we trust God through all things, then mm. we uh, constantly keep moving along. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank both of you for taking your time this afternoon to be with us. And for the rest of you, please take seriously the call of the bishop to become missionary disciples for life. Uh, and no matter what new structures may evolve, it's still the Church of Jesus Christ, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Hey Father, question for you today. Um, what happens if I die before going to confession when I've committed a mortal sin? That's a really in-depth question. Uh, we all know that if you commit a mortal sin, it removes grace from our soul. And if we don't have grace on our soul, we can't get into heaven. So what happens if we're not able to go to confession to receive again the gift of sanctifying grace and the absolution of our sins, and we suddenly die. Could you go to heaven? Well, first of all, God's mercy is boundless. And if we have contrition in our heart, uh, a sorrow for what we've done, God forgives us. Uh, but it's always advised, if you have 
a mortal sin, get to confession right away. We're going to offer this prayer for the Bishop's Initiative called Set Ablaze, which is about the changes that are happening uh, around us, that we be unafraid, that we be open, that we always say yes to what God is calling us to do. Glory be to the Father, and, and to, to the, the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and, and ever shall be, world of God, and amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next Thursday.